and Democrat Connor Lamb as an early indicator for what the, to expect in the midterm elections. Recent polling shows them again tied. The district went overwhelmingly for President Trump in 2016. Both candidates have military experience. They highlight that in their latest campaign ads. Watch. As the father of two sons in the military, I understand what it means to send young people into battle. Right now, America needs experts with real experience because lives are on the line. What's missing in our society is that same thank you to the people who serve every day in our schools, in our hospitals, on our streets and in our construction sites. It helps us remember who to say thank you to. And it helps us remember that service is the rent we pay for living. And to let you know that this is a big deal, <laughs> former Vice President Joe Biden is headed to the Western Pennsylvania District today to campaign on Lamb's behalf. And President Trump will go there on Saturday to hold a campaign style rally. He's already endorsed Rick Saccone. Josh? Yeah. Well, look, I, every special election has some unique circumstances. Not all of them are bellwethers of what's to come. But I do think we have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen in terms of Democratic turnout. We saw some examples in the Virginia election earlier this year. We saw it again in Alabama. And I suspect we'll see it again in Pennsylvania with an awful lot of Democrats that are extremely motivated to go out and vote. What's interesting from, from my perspective about this race is the Democrat is actually running against his own party. He's cut an ad to camera basically saying that he's uh, against everything that Nancy Pelosi stands for, right? So he's trying to kind of work within the confines of a conservative district to suggest that somehow a Republican light would be uh, more advantageous to his candidacy, but we'll see how it works out. You put that very kindly. You know, Adrian, he says he wouldn't even vote for Nancy Pelosi. And he's yeah. a Democrat. <laughs> yeah, look, you know, first of all, th this race shouldn't even be competitive, right? Because Trump carried this district by 20 points in just a year and, a year and four months ago when he was running for the presidency. Um, but look, this is, a bell this is turning into what's considered to be a bellwether seat. Um, I worked at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee during the 2005-2006 cycle when Democrats took back control of the House. And plenty of our candidates then were running ads against Leader Pelosi. That's just kind of what you do. You've got to show your independence. Um, <laughs> so they didn't like her then either? No, it's, it's not that it's showing that you are independent years. from the National Party in Washington <laughs> is what it is. So, again, and I think that we, we would certainly, we certainly have seen this on the Republican side as well. well. You know what's interesting about what Adrian is saying, Katie, is that is how long apparently some within the Democratic Party have thought that they've needed change. You remember yeah. Barack Obama said they need new car smell, and he was talking, I believe, about Hillary Clinton. So yeah. what does that say? I, I think the, the, the wanting change in the Democratic Party started when, when Barack Obama came out, of, came out of nowhere to beat Hillary Clinton in 2008. And it's been a long time coming for Nancy Pelosi, but she's been able to hold on to power because she has the purse strings, right? But to say that this district is something that should definitely be going to Republican isn't actually quite right because there are more registered Democrat voters in this district than there are Republicans. And as Josh already said, Democrats are very motivated to come out and vote. The other thing, too, that I find interesting is this Democratic candidate, Connor Lamb, is not far left as the, we've seen the Democratic Party he's go. Like he's anti-establishment, but he's not far left in the sense of the anti-police message. We saw in that ad he just ran, mm -hmm. stand up for the police. He's mm -hmm. very moderate when it comes to a number of issues and actually represents the dying blue dog Democrat. And it's going to be difficult for them to, to and, and he also that he, That's actually what struck me as well about this race is that those who are running against Nancy Pelosi from the Democrats are usually coming from the left. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And it was very right. interesting yeah. to mm -hmm. me that, you know, I mean, in mm -hmm. so many places, mm -hmm. she and Dianne Feinstein are not considered radical enough any longer and are sort of being thrown overboard for that reason. And when I saw these candidates come out and how similar they are in a lot of ways or more so than you would see in, in other districts, it struck me that, wow, he's atta attacking Nancy Pelosi from the right. And is that something, if that's successful, what does that mean going forward? Well, we'll see. But I think, you know, ultimately, going back to Katie's point, I mean, he is an independent candidate, right? He is running. Um, oh, he's a Democrat. He fits the pro. Well, <laughs> he's, a, he's a Democrat, but he's. I mean, he may be so far right. He feels like an independent right, to you, right, right, fine, but, but he is a Democrat. But he is running. He is running somewhat independent of the National Party, which I think is a v very important, especially in districts like this. Um, and secondly, he is 
running on his own platform and on his own message. And this shows the importance of recruitment in some of these districts. Again, going back to the yeah. 06 cycle, we did recruit candidates like Brad Ellsworth, Heath Shuler, who were pro-Second Amendment, who were pro-life, and still ran as Democrats. And let, this be, and let this be a lesson to all the voters in Pennsylvania. All of those candidates voted for Obamacare and promptly got booted out of Congress right. four years later. So as much as this uh, particular candidate would like, love to have everybody convinced that they're not going to go in there and support Pelosi by electing him, basically, it, takes them one step there closer is. to putting Nancy Pelosi with the speaker's gavel. For a second, though, because, I mean, when you talk about, okay, he's going to run separate from the national, I, I would assume that that's because Democrats are doing such a, a, a bad job at fundraising right now. I mean, you guys are really struggling on a national level. So you take those politics back again local. Republicans are not struggling as much. Or at all, if you look nationally, they're yeah. really bringing it in. They're winning on that one. Yeah, you know, look, th there is an enthusiasm gap anytime a president and a new majority come into office. I think in the last 150 years, basically only twice has a majority party not lost seats in the House sure. in their first midterm. And I think that historical trend probably holds. The last time it didn't hold was after 9-11, which clearly the mm. environment right. was much, much different. So mm. there are challenges for, for Republicans here, no doubt about it. Yeah, for sure. And the other race that we're not paying attention to in this race is the 2020 race race between Joe Biden potentially and President Donald Trump because mm -hmm. they're both going to be in Pennsylvania campaigning for their respective candidates. So, yep. All right, moving on. It looks like Hillary Clinton is looming over Democrats' attempts to take back Congress. Two former Clinton allies, both cabinet secretaries under Bill Clinton, say they will run for seats of retiring Republicans. Former Health and Human Services Secretary Donna Shalala, who also ran the Clinton Foundation for a time, filed paperwork for the House seat currently held by Republican Eliana ross Lathian of Florida. And former Congressman Mike Espy, who served as President Clinton's Secretary of Agriculture, says he has a strong intention to run for Thad Cochran's Senate seat. Yesterday, the Mississippi Republican announced he will retire. So, Adrian, is it really a good look for uh, someone who was running the Clinton Foundation to be trying to run for Congress, given sure. all the baggage that Hillary had uh, in her course. campaign with the foundation? Of course. Look, ultimately, I think it's n number one, not exactly uh, fair to really classify these two people as Clinton sur surrogates. I mean, they are, but they have careers that are completely independent from working for Secretary Clinton, working for President Clinton in the administration. But look, Mike Espy, he comes from a huge family in the Delta region of Mississippi. Um, he's very well known in that area. I, I don't, I'm still not entirely convinced that Democrats can win statewide in Mississippi. We haven't seen that happen since 1982. And interestingly enough, Haley Barber uh, was defeated um, in Mississippi, which is uh, really kind of hard to <laughs> imagine. Um, and then Donna Shalala, again, she has a career that's completely uh, independent and has done amazing work separate from her work in the administration, which, by the way, was also fantastic. So, are they, are again, she's going to nail that she'll... message home, though, when Republicans go after her for the Clinton Foundation connection. Well, not well, they, even the they Clinton may, Foundation. but I think she will stand. I think that she will stand again. You know, we could we could sit here and litigate the Clinton Foundation all day long. I'm very proud of all the work the Clinton Foundation has done. She's got a lot to run on in terms of the strong record there. But Donald Shalala has also had a completely incredible career separate from the foundation. I think it also goes to show that the Clintonistas basically can't give it up, right? <laughs> I mean, they're, they're one last shot at power with Hillary Clinton evaporated, and so now every one of them out for themselves trying to figure out a way to get back on board. But, but this race is interesting in Mississippi for one, mm -hmm. for one reason, I think, is because Republicans have the capability here of doing another Roy Moore episode. Yeah. Um, currently, you've got Chris McDaniel, I affectionately call yep. him Mississippi Roy Moore. Yeah. Um, following <laughs> oh, the no. Alabama Roy Moore. <laughs> Accurate. No. Um, but he's right now fi filed to run against in a primary Senator Roger Wicker, a very conservative uh, senator from Mississippi, is doing a great job. But what he said yesterday after the retirement of Thad Cochran was, you know, look, if this, if this is an easier race for me, I may switch. I may get in against somebody else that the governor would appoint. The problem is the way that la right. race lines up, it's a runoff. Right. So if you have two or three Republicans in there that split the Republican yep. vote against somebody like Mike Espy, who will unify a Democratic vote, I'll be darned if you can't figure out how to lose a state like Mississippi. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you guys. That, may. That, that's a really talking, interesting it, point. But to the larger question of kind of what's going on in, in all of these races, I was talking to a great branding expert recently, Brewster Kell, who was saying that what we really saw in the last election 
was the power of personalities. And, you know, on both sides, I mean, you had Bernie Sanders and you had President Trump mm -hmm. out there as really unlikely characters to lead their party and to have that much support behind them. And it really shows you once again that you can't run against something successfully, that there has to be a dynamic person out in front, perhaps less so in these local races where there are only a few choices and you're talking about really battling back against the larger scene. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Democrats going forward, I mean, because obviously this goes for both parties. Republicans had this problem forever. Yeah. You need that really magnetic personality out front who's there to inspire people. And, and that's kind of the problem that you Hillary Clinton hit, always had. Well, we also the had nail on the head for the book that Hillary Clinton wrote, What Happened? <laughs> right? No, I we still don't know. Mean that. I mean, if you, if you peel away all of the politics and, and the fact that the DNC was, you know, kind of game the refs against <laughs> Bernie Sanders. Yeah. I mean, if you if you put all that aside, I mean, you had the, the dynamic personality in Bernie Sanders yeah. up against someone who I've even heard Democrats describe is, you know, not as exciting to yeah. be kind about that. But it also speaks to the issue of post-Trump. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, a, oh, yeah. a double term for him or not, what will Republicans do? Because totally. he's a dynamic person. But Josh, it's I, want, I, I want to ask you, though, because Republicans do have a problem with a number of House members retiring early, right. getting out of these districts yeah. that Hillary Clinton won or that maybe she, you know, they see will be flipped to blue in the midterms. They have a problem on their hands when it comes to getting voters to turn out. What do you think is going to happen? There are some extremely daunting statistics when it comes to an incumbent party, a majority party, their first midterm on retirements, it's something like 90 plus percent of those mm -hmm. seats flip that become open. Yep. That alone, I think, is a huge concern for House Republicans. And they're, you know, busy trying to rectify that. Some good work on the outside by Congressional Leadership Fund. And I think they're going to be in good shape to try to defend a lot of those seats. But the statistics are not That's kind. That's a big problem. Well, and you yeah. talk about the brain trust there, too. When you look at the openings on committees, it really speaks right. to not that there's not a lot of talent coming forth. But that talent then is, is does not have the same amount of experience that some of the exiting members have. That's right. Well, speaking of Hillary Clinton, a former campaign insider is now pointing the finger at President Obama, saying he dropped the ball when it came to stopping Russia from meddling in the 2016 presidential election. Why she says Clinton world is so frustrated. Plus, the White House pushing back after a series of stunning interviews with a former Trump campaign aide who's now under the spotlight of special counsel Robert Mueller. Sam Nunberg changing his tune, what he's saying now and why the White House says they aren't concerned. Former Trump campaign aide Sam Nunberg now saying he will end up cooperating with Robert Mueller's Russia probe after vowing to defy a subpoena he received from the special counsel. He also said this yesterday regarding a feeling that he took away from a previous interview he had with Mueller's team. I know that you have said uh, that you do think that they have something on Donald Trump. Yeah. The, the I don't know what it from is. From the interview, but, but you're confident in that. So what made you feel that I way? I can't explain it unless you were in there. I can't explain it unless you were in there. Then that's the answer. You're not going to like that answer. I can't explain it. But they have something. I just get a feeling he did something. Oh, boy. The White House yesterday pushed back on any claims that number could have knowledge of potential Trump misconduct. Doug McElway is live at the White House with all of the details. Doug. Hi, Melissa. And there was perhaps a more revealing soundbite from Sam Nunberg on that very show, same show, spoken just moments later, which helps to shed, shed some light on uh, why he went about what some are calling an unhinged tirade over the course of a six-hour period yesterday. Here it is. We talked earlier about what people in the White House were saying about you. Yeah, talking about listen. whether you you were you were drinking or on drugs or whatever they uh, had happened today. Um, talking to you, yeah. I have smelled alcohol in your breath. Well, I, I have not had a drink. I know it's awkward. Let me just get give you the question. Well, you can uh, categorically answer, answer that. Uh, no, you have you had a drink answer, today? My answer is no. I have not. Anything else? No. 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 Besides my meds. Uh, Nunberg there was referring to the antidepressant medications that he takes. It is a well-known physiological fact uh, that antidepressant medications can heighten, can amplify the effects of alcohol. Among the things that he spouted off was that then-candidate Donald Trump was aware of the Trump Tower meeting between Donald Trump Jr. and a group of Russians in June of 2016. He also alleged this. Carter Page? Never met the guy in my life. Never do you, met do him. You think, do you think Carter Page has criminal exposure? 
I think Carter Page colluded with the Russians. And I've told you that before. I've told and, you that and, privately. I think he colluded with the Russians. And how well, whatever caused Nunberg to vent this way, uh, the growing legal consensus is that he made a terrible, terrible mistake by doing so, a terrible legal mistake by promising not to cooperate with Mueller's subpoena and by saying uh, that it was funny uh, if Miller would put me in jail. No wonder that today he made an abrupt about face promising to cooperate with Mueller. The fact is, if Nunberg does not comply, I have no doubt that Bob Mueller will put him in jail, period. I think that if Mueller allowed Nunberg to defy the subpoena, I think it would send a message to the world that it's okay to defy Bob Mueller and not cooperate. Uh, jail cells have a way of looking not so funny when you're appearing from the inside of one looking on the outside. The White House today has not commented on his uh, comments after it all wrapped up last night after the early stages of the White House uh, press conference yesterday. And then Charlie Gasparino tweeted just uh, within the past hour or so, this is important, he said, just spoke with Nunberg Sam. He told me he is fully cooperating now with Mueller's team and he's intending to go get treatment following his grand jury appearance on Friday. I think that helps to explain a lot. The big question is why did so many media outlets continue to cover this as his unhinged nature began to manifest itself more and more as the evening wore on? Back to you. All right, Doug McElway, thank you so much for that. Um, Josh, I'll start with you. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to watch. I want to emphasize again what he said to Charlie Gasparino as Charlie is tweeting from Fox Business that he's going to seek treatment. Um, what do you take away, other than you know, sort of the painful nature of watching all that. Um, what do you take away from it about what's going on with the investigation going forward? Because it does make it hard to sort of sort through what is meaningful within what he said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that we can derive a lot from the investigation. We have no idea whether Sam Nunberg is an essential player here. And you know that Bob Mueller is trying to obtain as much information as possible. I mean, look, I, as a general rule, it's probably not a great sign when the host of the show that you're appearing on is asking if you're drunk. Yeah. And, and that's the way he appeared all day yesterday. And whatever questions that Bob Mueller had, they couldn't have had any more than the seven hours of cable television that he, that he did yesterday, which was... Not only a legal problem, but, you know, look, we're starting to border on ethical issues here in terms of our ability and willingness to put somebody like that on air all day. Because, you know, he clearly was out of his mind. He clearly was making all kinds of allegations he couldn't substantiate. And, you know, I think at some level we probably have a responsibility to... It, that's true, that but in. I mean, he really he said a lot of things that are that are pertinent to the president of the United States, and I I don't if know if you I've believe known... they're accurate, right? But he has absolutely zero reputation for accuracy in his entire career. I mean, this is somebody that journalists won't even quote on the record. Mm, interesting. All right. Yeah. Look, I agree with Josh on this one. I don't really know how credibly we can take Sam. I think he was only working on the campaign for what five six months, um, but he did make some insinuations that you know he doesn't want his in emails released because he and Roger Stone were trash talking people and he does think that Trump was involved in some sort of level of collusion. So I think ultimately at this point this is Bob Mueller who is going to look into this and make some sort of determination as to what his effect was um, and, and how much information he does truly know about the campaign. Yeah. Harris. All right, we've got this breaking news now, and it has to do with advisor to the president, Kellyanne Conway. I'm going to look down at my phone for a moment here, too, uh, because this is uh, purporting, this is coming from the office of the special counsel, the U.S. office of the special counsel, we'll heretofore call it the OSC, has found two violations by Kellyanne Conway of the Hatch Act, and that is using your, your position uh, in government to advocate for or against a Senate candidate, a House candidate, someone holding uh, a position or running for office. Uh, there are two instances, according to the OSC. They say one was Kellyanne Conway advocating against a Senate candidate, and that would be the Democrat Doug Jones. Remember the special election in Alabama. Uh, and then the second instance is her advocating for government positions for partisan political purposes, including by trying to influence partisan elections. Right. So the first interview that she did uh, was on this network with, one, with Fox and 
and Friends, the second interview in question where she was acting her official capacity discussing the Roy Moore versus Doug Jones election in Alabama happened on another network and the office, U.S. Office of Special Counsel is not the special counsel that Robert Mueller is, is running. I want to make sure that people have that separately. This is an office that oversees uh, ethics violations, a series of uh, ethics groups, watchdog groups, when she made these statements, filed complaints with the OSC, and now that they have found her in violation, they will refer her for disciplinary action to the president. So it is up to President Trump to determine if she will face consequences for that. We knew, Josh, that this was happening, that they were looking at these two instances. We didn't know exactly, you know, what the outcome would be because we, we didn't know that they would refer this to the president of the United States. What does this mean for the White House? Well, look, I think there are a lot of mitigating circumstances here, too. I mean, what we know in uh, the course of an interview is it's a dynamic situation. You're uh, liable to be asked about anything. And in this case, she was asked about a partisan election and she responded uh, it, it much in the same way that her boss, President Trump, would have s responded to the question. And so I think that's a mitigating circumstance. So here. That, that's an interesting uh, observation, too, because if you are saying what the president would also say, then I'm sure Americans may be watching and wondering, well, how is there any difference? Yeah. Well, I, I look, I got to look at this in terms of what's the spirit of the Hatch Act here. Is this using your government office to go out and try to get somebody elected or somebody defeated? Mm -hmm. Or is this an interview where you're basically advocating for the same position as the president of the United mm -hmm. States? I would argue that if, if what they have here are two interviews, that's pretty thin gruel. That's be yeah. hard. I see you nodding, Adrian. Well, look, I, I think the Hatch Act is, is, is sometimes it's, it's kind of there. It is a gray act in so many respects, right? Because, you know, the real question is, was she doing something on taxpayer payroll? Was she doing something when she was on federal, you know, when she was getting paid by federal taxpayer dollars, essentially? So the question is, is was she doing this in her personal time or in her personal capacity? Or was she actually doing this on government time? And if she was doing this on government time, that, of course, is where can, red flags are raised. I ask you a question though how do you know the difference because everybody's 24 ask. 7 right now and now that you've just lost another communications director everybody is working 24 7 so oh, I, I think the I fair can... question is when does personal when do those things start and begin I, I, I go back I to Josh. Josh. every time a candidate stumps for another candidate I well mean, when you have somebody how is it different you when you're a staff yourself? member and and you have the resources of the federal government there are some really dark lines about not using any resources the taxpayers pay for as a government expense in order to advocate for partisan elections. But like I said, an interview is a very different thing because you you can be asked about all kinds of different circumstances and you can't control that, right? I mean, we don't script uh, you questions. Can't or you control your answers. To answer. I think OSC right. is, is specifically looking at her answer and whether she was, they say, based on the recommendation, she was advocating in her official capacity as an advisor to the president for Roy Moore over um, his opponent in Alabama. So. Hold New on. developments on the top FBI agent fired from Robert Mueller's investigation. What sources tell us Peter Strzok never followed up on it. This is critical because Strzok was also involved in editing the memo delivered by former FBI Director James Comey exonerating Hillary Clinton in the case. The initial draft of that memo said that it was, quote, reasonably likely that hostile actors had hacked Clinton's server. That was later changed to say it was, quote, possible that that had happened. Here's then Director Comey reading that memo to the American public. She also used her personal email extensively while outside the United States, including sending and receiving work-related emails in the territory of sophisticated adversaries. We assess it is possible that hostile actors gained access to Secretary Clinton's personal email account. Let's talk first about the wording reasonably likely down to possibly. A downgrade there. No question. No question about it. You know, I, I think of all of the investigations that we've got going on, House investigation, Senate investigation, Bob Mueller, we've got all kinds of things happening here. Perhaps the most significant investigation of them all is the one we hear least about, which is this Inspector General's report. Because what it is going to get at is the internal machinations at DOJ and exactly what happened, why these memos were changed, what actions people took as a result of information that they may or may not have had. And so we can understand 
understand why the Clinton investigation proceeded the way it did and how that eventually led us to the Russia investigation and everything else. I think this is hugely important. All this stuff is just critical information. What do you think it points to? Well, I mean, look, where there's smoke, there's fire on some of this stuff. But I, I think you look at this and this struck has been in the middle of all kinds of problems, yeah. right? I mean, every time it augurs towards his pointing in the other direction every time Hillary Clinton seems to be in trouble here and him sort of looking towards the, the Trump campaign as a source of a lot of ill will. And I, I just don't know that that's, it seems like he's got a thumb on the scale. Mm -hmm. I, I think the constant seesawing back and forth could really make you sick. I mean, we either care about Russian meddling and we care about, you know, cyber espionage or we don't. And in this case, they're saying, oh, it's possible when in fact the statement should have been, there is evidence that it's likely. I mean, it's not evidence that is, you know, they saw the metadata, they saw something unusual in it that indicated hacking that doesn't prove it conclusively or who it was as far as I know. I mean, maybe it does, but they really changed the language and it kind of, it, you know, it strikes me as the point that you've made before where it's, you know, President Obama said it, you know, it was ludicrous to think that the Russians could influence the election when President Trump said it. And then all of a sudden it's that the right doesn't care about influencing the election. And we're kind of, I, I think on every well, side, we, kind of weaving yeah. back and forth. We either care about this stuff or we don't. You know, there is a downgrading and upgrading, a, yeah. a moving over of a lot of language. We, we know from it was an investigation to a matter, just to bring that back mm -hmm. into the conversation. Right. So we, we've seen kind of those verbal gymnastics. At the end of the day, though, you, you look at a presidential candidate back then, Adrian, for mm -hmm. your political party. Yep. These were problematic situations now that have started to kind of come out. Where does that put Hillary Clinton's role in the party as she gets ready to, I guess, help out in the midterm election? Oh, she's always going to have a major role in the party, and she's going to be campaigning. <laughs> is for that okay? Absolutely, it's okay. She, uh, and you're you okay gotta remember, with what this you is gotta remember, she she still received. And we're okay with it too, by the way. Three we million more votes. Republicans like this too. We love right? Hillary Clinton. Come on back. It keeps her a little quiet. Three million more <laughs> votes than President Trump ultimately. But but look, going back to the, this investigation. Um, I'm really glad that you framed what you just said the way you did because it is so important, no matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican, to get to the bottom of what actually happened. You know, what if, for example, the Russians decided, yeah, we don't want President Trump. Do you oh, think Democrats about, care as much about Russian meddling if it was you guys? Absolutely, really? I do. You might absolutely. want to call some people. No, there's no question. Look, Let I'm speaking know. obviously for myself, but but the, absolutely. What about the accountability for Hillary Clinton for giving away the game? Let's not forget that she had top secret classified information on her server, including information about human sources on the ground, which means those sources had their lives put in danger because Hillary Clinton went to foreign countries where they have heavy hacking abilities that are adversaries to the United States and decided to send some emails on her personal unsecured server to get away without having any kind of oversight from the American people and from Congress. She gave the Russians. They didn't have to hack anything. She put it out there, classified information about what we were doing at the State Department on a silver platter for them, and yet she's the one who isn't held accountable, and the FBI is giving her a pass and saying, ah, her server maybe probably was hacked, but we're not going to actually hold her accountable for well, the selling FBI out state her secrets to foreign she lost the election. And by the way, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you saying that she lost the election because of her own behavior? No, I'm Katie saying that I think James out? Comey reopening the investigation 10 days before the election, which, by the way, this particular agent, Stroke, that we're talking about, is the one who said we should reopen. The so do you agree so with firing James, James Comey, or is that something that's bad because Trump did it? You know, I think I have a lot of mixed feelings about the James <laughs> about James Comey in general. But I he think. lost you the election, so shouldn't you want him to be fired? <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I think that he did a good job as FBI director in some contexts, but I also Until think 10 that days he, before the election. I think him reopening the investigation is ultimately what you caused You have made Josh Holmes giggle. <laughs> I, I am just, I'm going to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. It's, it's, it's perfect. As you guys go back and forth. Well, one thing is for sure, your candidate didn't win, and now we're finding out a whole lot, and that would, I imagine, would have come out anyway. Well, let's see what the report says. Okay. Uh, a former Hillary Clinton campaign surrogate is now pointing the finger at then-President Obama for not doing enough to stop Russian meddling in 2016. But Obama's former right-hand man says a top Republican stood in the way. We'll debate the blame game. Stay close.